I have procrastinated on this way too long. I've basically been brainstorming making a video about my asexuality for over a month now, and this is a problem I've had since college. Every time I had a paper due, I would procrastinate until the very last moment to write it because I could not hone down my thesis to just one idea. Once you start thinking about things, you think about all the things. Yes, I've been depressed and life has been busy and I'm a little bit heartbroken, but this is just a hard video to make. And some of you have made it very clear that you are not interested in this video, which, you know, that's fine. You do you, girl. This isn't for you. The reason this video is hard is because it has to do with identity. And identity is like water. It freezes, it melts, it sublimates, and evaporates. It's boiled and condensed. It takes on so many forms and you really just can't can't capture it in one state. I think for the most part, we've been trained to be as coherent as possible because being neat means you are easily manipulated and moved around and exploited and just organized for the system. But what I've kind of discovered recently is that if I stick with just one facet of myself forever, that's not gonna feel good. Nothing really lasts forever, right? Not my underwear, not the garlic, some things longer than others, but Change, deterioration, cycles. Oh, you made it. Are you throwing taking, this out? Yeah, taking shit out. So I've just been waiting and waiting and waiting until the perfect moment to be ready to make this video. And guess what? Haven't been ready yet. Goodbye, bed. It served us well, better than ever could have expected. <laughs> and then last week on Instagram, somebody commented, just start. Let it flow. The intimidation in writing those college papers and in making this video is bulked in this idea that I have to be right about something, that I have to know myself and I have to know others and about sexual orientation, all these theories. But really, maybe none of us know. And so we're just gonna do it because many of you did want to see this happen and you're so interested and I'm also interested and maybe it'll flow. I hope it will. It's already been so cool to see all these comments come through on the community page. We got a lot of fellow ace comrades in the house. We got some allies and we got some questioning partners that just want to know what's best for their partners. I'm hoping to answer a lot of these questions, but I'm also keeping in mind that I am just one person living one life and I have a lot of uncertainties and questions I can't answer for myself. But with that in mind, Let's make some dessert. There is an ongoing joke about asexuality folks and cake. Namely, that sex is so dispensable to us, we often prefer the pleasures of cake over the pleasures of sex. I'll link to an article somewhere up here that I think you might wanna read because it's short, it's nice, and it's simple to understand. Again, just one perspective, but maybe it'll help you in understanding. This week, I wanna make some desserts with what I have in this kitchen already. We have some quail eggs and chicken eggs that I've had since December. It's now March. Is it still good? I don't know. We'll see. We're gonna do what you know me best for, an experiment. This means we're gonna try to bake and make desserts without any recipes. For me, and I hope for you too, there is a certain kind of undescribable joy that comes from just freewheeling it. It's a way for me to embrace freedom without fear, or rather, with the knowledge that I will fail and fall, but that's all part of the process. It has taught me that uncertainty can be comforting if I accept it as normal. And as we bake and eat and snack on these things, I'm gonna answer some of your questions. And hopefully, we'll feel a little bit better about not being so normal all the time. The spoiler alert is, if the identity doesn't work for you, fuck it. Mm-hmm, this will be a weird video, but here, we love the weird, don't we? Will it come together during the edit, or will it flop like a discombobulated mummy rotting away in the back of the compost bin? We'll see. We'll begin with an easy question and an easy dessert. Natasha asks, do you like the ace flag colors, design? Wikipedia says the black represents asexuality, the gray represents gray asexuality and demisexuality, the white represents non-asexual partners and allies, and the purple represents community. Do I like it? Not really. 
Not a huge fan of flags, to be honest. The stripes and striations separate us and segregate us into very clear-cut boundaries next to each other, and I'm just not feeling it. I don't really think we're meant to be separated into such clear categories, and I would really like a flag that has like a little bit of smooth marbling or, you know, ombre happening. That could be cool. Anything that muddies the water a little bit. For that, we're gonna make some candied almonds. Very simply, I'm gonna take a wide and shallow pan. I'm gonna put it on the heat over medium. I'm going to sprinkle over a little bit of sugar and wait for it to melt completely. And then we're gonna go in with some toasted almonds. If you want the almonds to not seize the sugar, make sure they are a little bit warm and not freezing cold. You can heat it up in the oven or in the microwave, whatever you prefer. While your sugar is melting, set up a landing pad. I like to use a baking sheet lined with a sill pad. You can also use parchment. You just need a nonstick surface for those hot caramelized nuts to land. This may ask of you a little bit more patience in the beginning, but once it gets going, it goes fast. Some parts of the sugar in the pot will burn faster than the other, so just give it a nice little shake and make sure nothing is too burnt before the others start to melt. You know, some days I look in the mirror and I say to myself, you might be unstable, but at least you're cute. And that helps me to sleep at night. If you have chunkies, you can stir them very gently. Try to not agitate it too much. It might crystallize more than you want. You're gonna wanna use a non-stick silicone spatula for this. Once the sugar is shiny and pooled and liquidy, throw in your warm nuts, and then you can season with whatever you want. Salt and pepper for a savory kick, or you can go in with some rose powder or cinnamon, or if you wanna go crazy, all of them. The choice is yours. Once the sugar is evenly coating all the almonds, turn off the heat and put it on the sill pad immediately. While it's still warm, you wanna make sure that you are flattening out the almonds in a single layer so that they don't really clump too much. We're gonna let these beauties cool completely before snacking on them. And in the meantime, I'm gonna make myself a protein shake because I'm hungry. I hope you're very excited for this carbtastic week. Five second rule, this little guy really wanted to be eaten. Look at how shiny it is. Glassy, one might say. My God, that is good. I am a fan. And on your spatula, you basically have flax brittle. Nice, smooth, slightly smoky, sugary glass with a little tiny peppery kick in the back of the throat, a little crunch from all the almonds and the breaking sugars and the flaxseed. You are being lifted away on a bouquet of deliciousness. Next up, banana nut muffins. And question two. The second question concerns my discovery and journey through asexuality. That's a big one. As you can see, these bananas are very ripe. I think they will be very sweet. To really counterbalance that icky, cloying sweetness of bananas that they can do for baked goods, I'm going to make another caramel. This time, we're gonna have a little bit of a bitter coffee vibe to it, just to, you know, give it some seesaw action. For banana nut muffins, I actually really prefer untoasted walnuts, but you do you, girl. I'm gonna put my pan back on the heat, a layer of sugar. Let it melt, let it start smoking, and then pull it off. I have prepared for you a little spoken word. <clears throat> I do not need to come out of anything unless I have been placed inside a jail. Who has put me there? And does freedom come first in the mind or the body? I told my parents and my first and only that I was asexual. None of them really believed me then. Maybe I didn't really believe me then. In college, I daydreamed about hugging sometimes, a grazing of lips, closeness and proximity without invasion. I dreamed of conversations, of questions being answered. I dreamed of understanding, of having the ability to be understood. They would not believe me when I said who I am enough times that I no longer understood myself. Who I said I was, who I said I am, am I? we're gonna make our flax egg. Flax egg is a nice vegan substitute if you don't have chicken eggs to use in your baked goods. It works especially well for things like cake and muffins. I like to take about a tablespoon of flax seeds and combine it with about two to three tablespoons of liquid. It doesn't really matter for me. It just depends on how much moisture you want in your baked good. I'm going to combine this in our vanilla yogurt. Yogurt is really good in muffins. It keeps them really nice and moist. And this vanilla already comes seasoned with more vanilla 
vanilla flavor as well as some sugar. And no, I'm not using a recipe, but I will measure some of these ingredients for you in case they turn out good and I have amounts, then you will have a recipe. Once your oil and your sugar is somewhat combined, it's time to mash in those nanas. If your sugar has solidified to the pot, just place it back on very low heat to let it melt back up. Was letting the sugars cool down in the pot a mistake? Yes. Are we gonna make more? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna mash those two bananas until they are very, very creamy and hopefully everything will slowly melt together. You might make mistakes, but as long as you're alive, you'll find a way to come out of them. And who knows? Maybe you'll be even tastier because of it. The same way high school teachers told me I was too smart to want to be just a teacher, men would say to me in various ways, I am not ugly enough to be ace. Sometimes I wonder how we learn to think the way we do. The important thing is to taste it as you go, to see if you like it, to see if you want change. A little sprinkle of salt, add in your flax egg, and yes, we're gonna build the batter right in here so that I don't have to wash another friggin' thing. We're gonna add in some baking powder along with baking soda. We're going to add in some whole wheat flour along with some bran. I'm getting old, I need my fiber. It's already looking a little bit dry, so we're gonna stream in some milk. And I also remember that somebody gifted me coquito. So we're gonna put a splash of that in too. We're gonna preheat our oven to 375 and then we're gonna crush in some walnuts and if you want, some crushed chocolate as well into the batter. Alongside the walnuts, I'm also going to put in some ground nutmeg, some cinnamon, and some coffee. We're gonna take a muffin pan, we're going to put it on a sheet tray, we're gonna line it with liners, and we're going to just dole out this fantastic muffins-to-be batter. As for this last banana, I think I'm going to uh, put it on a sill pack and see if we can turn it into like banana jerky. I don't think I realized until college that something was off. Everybody was talking about, you know, wanting to bone each other and all of that. And I was like, hmm, 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 interesting, really. And I don't know, because literally everyone around me was talking about having sex and getting horny and all of that. I, I did think there was something wrong with me. I felt like maybe there was something broken, but also I was like, I don't want to be like you sluts. We'll get into that later. I wouldn't say my asexuality really posed a problem until I realized that a lot of other people wanted a lot more sex than I did. And in order to actually participate in a loving romantic relationship the way I had imagined it, we'll get into that later too, sex was necessary and that was a friction. For our banana jerky, I'm going to smooth it out with an offset as flat as it'll go, making sure it's as even as possible. And then we're gonna sprinkle on a little bit of sugar and a little bit of sesame seeds, maybe a tiny, tiny sprinkle of salt. I think the difficulty of exploring relationship dynamics with someone who's allosexual as an asexual person really did push me to kind of lean towards pathologizing myself. And it took a few years. Might have taken like over a decade actually. Are we doing too much? Probably. Who's gonna stop me? Not you. Not me either. Wow, liberation. I think as with all identities that are not the mainstream accepted ones, you feel like you are in the wrong, that you are the one at fault. But really, how many of us have actually taken time to think about whether or not we want to be what we're told we should be? Not just in terms of sexuality, but in terms of every aspect of our existence. It's kind of doughy. <laughs> There's probably not enough fat and not enough sugar in here to read as a muffin in terms of dessert muffin, but who's to say if I wanted a dessert muffin to begin with? And you know, if you really wanted to, you can always add more butter. No one's stopping you. And if you wanted to, you can always add more sugar in various forms. You choose your poison, my dear. You live your life. I live mine. And you know, I'm always pro experimentation, but you really don't have to like anything because everybody else likes it. You have to figure out if you like it. In this case, I like the butter, but not the maple syrup. 
I remember in college, people always insisted that I need to drink alcohol because how would I live life without experiencing all these drugs? And you know what? I tried alcohol and I fucking hated it. It turns out that I'm actually allergic to alcohol and it creates so much inflammation in my body that it makes my joints hurt. And the first time my partner saw that happening to me, he was like, you gotta be joking. Your knees cannot be in pain because you drank alcohol, but they were. And you know what? People also told me that I need to try weed. And I I didn't try weed until I was 28 years old. And when I tried it, I was like, this is kind of amazing. I feel like a better version of myself. But do I regret not trying it earlier? No, because I simply wasn't ready to try it earlier. If there's one thing that I've learned in life, it's that you have to wait for yourself to be ready. Otherwise, there will be so much resentment or hurt from doing things and jumping into them when you simply aren't ready. This is amazing. <laughs> Have I missed out on relationships because I wasn't ready to engage the way the other person wanted me or needed me to? Yes, absolutely. Would it have turned out any better for me to have been involved in those relationships when I personally wasn't ready to do it? Probably not, but we'll never know now. For all of us out there who just didn't really want sex that much, what's wrong with that? The texture of this is so pleasing with the nuttiness of the sesame seeds and the light sprinkling of the cinnamon. It's like a really good snack. I think our society tends to jump to conclusions. If you don't do this in exactly this way, you're wrong. And that's because it's easier to control all of us and organize us in a fashion that is conducive to production if we all just abide by one singular rule. Unfortunately, that kind of hegemony just makes all of us miserable sooner or later because we are both the same and not the same. And there should be space allowed to us that lets us just be whatever we are in that moment. It complicates things, right? That's why we don't have that space. But if we are able to create it for ourselves, why not? Now, just because I'm on the ace spectrum, it does not mean that I hate sex. Yes, there are ace people who are repulsed by sex and there are people who are very pro-sex. Does that confuse you? We'll talk about that too. You can really taste the whole weediness of the wholesomeness of this muffin. It's tasting a little bit watery. I don't know if that makes sense. The walnuts help, the chocolate helps, and the banana flavors with that slight caramel tinge really helps it feel like not a rabbit food breakfast muffin for health freaks. So I would say I like this quite a lot. I don't know, maybe I'll finally start a Patreon and start giving you these shitty recipes that aren't recipes. You in? Now, I would say if I were still actively working as a recipe developer, I would not be happy enough about these muffins the way they turned out because they do not fit my conventional understanding of what is an acceptable dessert-like muffin to put out to the general public to make. From that kind of white American standpoint, this is not the epitome of a perfect muffin. But now that I don't work for a living to develop recipes, I'm more in tune with what I actually like to eat. And I like this. It's not the same as the muffin that I had imagined, but I like it. And in a way, I think a lot of these identities that I've had to think myself through is about understanding who I am outside the context of prescriptive living, prescriptive identities, prescriptive roles, and prescriptive perfection. One size does not fit all, and yet we are made to believe that it does, and that we can fit into that one size. And you wonder why we're sad all the time, trying to make ourselves fit into places that aren't really made for us. Even when thinking about making this video, a part of my brain was like, how do you fit into the YouTube world? Does this format work? What are you trying to say? Who is your audience? Does the world need this video? I don't know. Does the world really need anything new anymore? Is anything new anymore? Or, you know, are we just being bashed down to smaller and smaller, more specific bits of the same thing that we started with? Okay, I'm gonna take a seat. Next question. Hi, June. I wondered if you feel asexuality is partially impacted by one's cultural upbringing. Girl, <sighs> yes. That's your short answer. A few months back, a viewer recommended this fantastic book to me by Sharonda J. Brown, and it's seen through a black asexual lens. I'll link it, description box, somewhere up here. You might wanna check it out. I was born in Beijing. 
I grew up with Chinese immigrant parents who had very Christian values and they were pretty politically conservative when they came to the state. It's pretty ironic because when they were back in China, they had very aggressively counter-current vibes. Here, they were very much, how do I say this, racist mm -hmm. and um, queer phobic in a lot of different respects. Given that Christian element, I was raised with very puritanical values of, you know, virginity and purity until marriage and... I think from my parents' point of view, that was just a way to keep me safe. But unfortunately, a lot of the things that we hold on to to keep us safe actually hurt us. They become prisons in a way. And I've had to spend a lot of years breaking myself out of various prisons. Now, I am obviously still very much a Chinese immigrant who has had a Christian background. I no longer identify as religious in one school or another, but those values are in me. They were a part of me and they were formative. Do they still affect me psychologically? I think so. How has that lent its flavor to my asexuality? I'm sure a lot. And I think this is the part where we talk about intersectionality, our favorite word of the 21st century. Not only am I impacted by my cultural background and the values I was instilled with by my parents, there are also so many other intersectionalities to consider factoring into our sexual orientation. Charlotte asks, I would like to know how you would defend yourself from the maybe something's wrong with your lady parts allegations. Yeah, and um, you know, I don't have an answer to that. Could there be something wrong with my body? Maybe. But for all I know, with all of my experience in gynecologists' office, the world does not currently give a shit about women's reproductive health. I have had very irregular menses from the age of 14 when I got my first period, and I've been in and out of doctors' offices, diagnosed and not diagnosed with various potential conditions, and the only thing that was really prescribed to me to treat me and not even heal me is birth control pills to regulate the hormones. I still don't know what's wrong with me, if anything. But I think here's the little um, rub. No one is really healthy the way we think of health. No one is 100% all of the time. Especially as we get older, we just seem to collect ailments. And that in itself is a framework to reconsider. Am I broken? Am I broken mentally? Am I broken physically? Am I broken genetically? Socially? <laughs> Emotionally, I think all of the above, but I think we are meant to be broken. I think being broken is just the way of the world, how the chaotic universe operates. And I think breaking is normal. I think that's the, the B side to the album that we've never listened to before. Do you just have low libido or are you ace? I think that depends on how you want to identify. All of these identities, they are not scientific. If we pay attention to the psychological world, how they've diagnosed people with mental disorders, gay people were considered to be insane. People with no libido were considered to be insane. We've pathologized so many different aspects of ourselves that we always feel sick. Are we actually abnormal or are we just human. I was watching a video the other day on a channel called The Nameless Narcissist and he talks as a person who's been diagnosed with NPD and he said something like, we call things a disorder because we haven't figured out a solution and is it our fault that we don't have solutions? So no, I no longer think I'm broken in the way that other people aren't broken. I am broken in the way that everyone else is broken. If we want to reframe it, the word is not broken. The word is different. And different doesn't necessarily need to have a positive or negative connotation. It just is. So are you comfortable with who you are? That's the question. Doesn't matter what other people think. It does get complicated, however, when you want to build a relationship with other people who don't agree with your way of living, who can't seem to coincide their lives with yours in the same way that you want it. And that's when you have to compromise. And this isn't just about sexuality anymore, this is about everything in life. You compromise at your job, you compromise with your friendships, you compromise with your family members, and you even compromise with yourself. Because what is the self except a collection of reflections and echoes of what other people have said to you? I think I also suffer from depression. Like many of you, I probably also suffer from anxiety. These have become regular facets of living in our contemporary world. And do these mental illnesses and conditions affect how we perform sexually, how we frame the world, how we navigate our relationships of all sorts? I think absolutely. 
depression gets so bad sometimes you can't do your basic functions and I just think it goes without question that of course all of these things play a factor in how we feel, how we think, and who we become. Humans are pattern-seeking creatures. We think if something happens a couple of times that that might be an identity. But who's to say? You're in control as much as you can be. And beyond that, it just is. Hi. This might be a bit dark, sorry, but I want to ask, how can I tell I'm on the A spectrum or I'm just traumatized? Um, I think that's something that you have to find out for yourself. And I also don't know. It's something that I wonder myself sometimes too. It could always be worse, but I do wonder if at six that family friend's kid didn't give me a piggyback ride and didn't grope me when I was on his back, would I feel this way about relationships and sex? Or was there something formative, traumatic, out of control feeling in that moment over two and a half decades ago that I still carry with me to this day? I don't know. I think the invasion of your selfhood in any manner will stay with you forever. It doesn't mean that it's gonna break you, and it doesn't mean that you're not whole. It just means that it has changed you. I think now, in my 34th year, I've accepted that as simply a facet of life that we experience. It just comes with the terrain. There are many ways in which we can heal ourselves. The hardest part is learning about yourself in order to figure out what will heal you. But know that no matter how broken you may feel, that is a sign that you are already healing. That you are already past the point of having been broken in some way. That you have gained distance from it. That you realize that, that what happened, happened in the past. And today, every day, is a birthday of some sort. Every day you can choose to leave a little bit more of yesterday behind. Having struggled with like <laughs> a decade and a half at least of questioning all sorts of things in my life, I've come to be at a point where I think questioning is beautiful. I think not knowing is beautiful because in not knowing who you are, you have the potential to be many different things. It might be detrimental to us to be certain of our orientation and to lock ourselves into an identity. Identity is a prison, and when you are uncertain of it, you exist outside of it. Now, feeling extremely insecure about my body is something that I've dealt with since high school. If we really go into it, that day when I first entered the third grade and I had this really fobby, short boy cut hair and I went to the bathroom and asked the two boys in the hallway where the bathroom was and they pointed me to the boys' bathroom because of my hair and my dress. That might have been the first time I became aware of body insecurity. In high school, I had different types of disordered eating kick in and that has evolved over the last almost 20 years. And I still struggle with body image issues and I still struggle with disordered eating sometimes. But I have come to know myself more and more each year. There is a comfort in the repetition of insecurities. How do you work beyond those insecurities besides just letting time and practice do the work? I don't know if I have an answer to that. But does body insecurity factor into my discomfort surrounding sex and physical relationships? I don't think there is a doubt that it does. I think we're ready for some cookies. I have dates, I have basan, which is chickpea flour, I have cornmeal, and I have some homemade almond butter. Let's make some wacky date-filled cookies. The first thing we'll need to do date paste. I'm gonna try to use my mini spice grinder as a processor of sorts. We'll see if it works. As we're trying to grind our dates, I'm gonna add in some of this cardamom carob lavender powder. I kind of just want to get rid of it. I think I need a real food processor one of these days. our second machine out. Close enough, right? <laughs> I think we can work with this. 
I'm gonna ignore this mess for now and maybe we'll make a drink in it later. Help it clean itself out, you know? Work smarter, play smart. For this date-filled cookie, I'm basically envisioning a sort of like a bastardized mamul cookie, which is usually made with semolina flour. Instead, we're gonna use our chickpea flour and our cornmeal to kind of simulate that texture. And I also think I'm gonna flavor it with a little bit of mint. That's right, mint. Maybe this year I can be open to experimenting with other areas of my life, the way I experiment with baking and cooking. I'm going to use up this leftover softened flavored butter that has five spice in it, and I'm gonna combine it with a little bit of milk. I'm going to fold in our flowers by hand until it feels right. Who knows what that is, right? We'll stream in a little bit of maple, add in some baking powder, a little salt, and some powdered sugar. I'm going to add some sesame seeds and a little bit of sweetened shredded coconut. We're gonna give it a taste. Add a little bit of olive oil and a little more cornmeal. Am I shooting myself in the foot by making this a gluten-free dough? Potentially, probably. Science though. Glorious. Not gonna lie, it tastes pretty weird, but we're gonna let this sit in the fridge while we make our little tiny filling balls. I'm gonna scoop about one inch balls out and we're gonna freeze them until they're pretty solid. That way we can kind of just roll the dough around them to cover before shaping. Initially, I was gonna put the almond butter inside the dough, but I think we can make like a little sweetened icing to drizzle on top of the cookies. After a certain point, you just go, fuck it. And oftentimes, it's when you stop giving a shit that it starts to work out. I don't know what the logic of that is, but I don't think it's meant for us to understand. And for the folks who are wondering if I'm either bi, poly, lesbian, or other, the answer is currently no. I'm just, I'm having enough of a wild ride being ace slash demi, so you know, like, one thing at a time, please. There was definitely a time where I was like, maybe I like girls. Maybe that's why I don't really want sex with guys. But I tried cuddling with a girl. She was very nice. <sighs> I do have a short poem for you though, while we wait for our cookies to cool. I wish I could, as with many things in life, grow to love what I currently don't. As for confusion, isn't there always how to make sense of why some things are? and some things aren't. Is that a poem or did I just say the sentences differently? You know, again, categories, labels, who gives a shit? If you say that's not a poem, then it's not a poem. But if I say that's a poem, then it is a poem. And then who's right? As far as the autistic spectrum, you know, uh, I'll let you guys armchair diagnose me, but I don't think so. Um, what I am, what I'm not, is still who I am and what I be. <laughs> anyway, cookies, shall we? You know, that's not half bad. I really like it. The naked ones without the almond butter glaze already taste fairly sweet. There is something so nicely savory about that mint and the five spice in there though, with that chickpea flour giving it a slightly bitter hint. The crunchiness of the polenta definitely reads as coarse semolina. I think the combination of the olive oil and the butter gives it a really nicely slightly fried donut taste. Delectable, look at that drip. Look at it. I don't know what's sexier than this, guys. It's just silky, smooth. Shiny but matte, it meets all your dreams.
Wow, it tastes a little bit like fried chicken with the almond butter. Like, you know, fried chicken and honey on biscuits flavor profile. There is no meat in here. There's a little bit of butter. Otherwise, surprisingly savory and sweet and just meaty. I am delighted that we had made mm. such a confusing dessert for such a confusing topic. But at the end of the day, as long as you enjoy it, I do think at this point I have eaten way too much sugar for today, so I'm gonna tap out for the night, but not before we toast some cashews and walnuts, just in case we wanna play with it tomorrow. Sleep well, sexy babies. So then, uh, where were we? All right, romantic relationships versus platonic relationships versus sexual relationships. This is a hard question, and I think I know the perfect dessert for this question. We have this pie dough that I've had for probably over a year in my freezer. We also have this guava paste that I bought once upon a time because I thought it would be nice to make something for my friend slash crush for his birthday, and he loved it with this combo of guava and cream cheese in a pastry. So we have this expired block of cream cheese Let's use it. For someone on the ace spectrum, what is a friend in terms of a platonic friendship and what is a friend in terms of a romantic interest? For the longest time, I thought to myself, I don't know if there is a difference. But I think in the last two years, I've realized that there is a difference. The component of romantic attraction for me is I want to spend most of my day with this person. Not to say I don't want to spend most of the day with my friends, but there is just some sort of a pull that extends beyond platonic friendship in a romantic attraction. I think at the heart of it, there is this like need to possess someone in a altogether different dimension. For me, there is this sense of wanting to have some sort of physical connection with the person. Now, it might not be sex. It might just be a hug. It might just be a very long hug. It might be cuddling. It might be cuddling on the couch. It might be cuddling in the bed. It might be cuddling naked even, but that doesn't mean that I want sex. Does that make sense? I wouldn't say I pour all of my energy into something, but I think I do weigh romantic relationships a little bit more than friendships. Am I proud of that? Not really. I am starting to learn that this is just all a fairy tale we've been fed that is actually kind of poisonous. Just in witnessing my mom's search for the perfect man or a man who is kind and reliable and all of these things and seeing her not really find him for her entire life, uh, I'm not too sure that the way we've been taught to think about romantic relationships is the healthiest version to have in our heads all the time. I think now that I'm in my almost mid 30s, I'm discovering that I don't need a romantic relationship to feel whole, which is really nice and lovely. And I have friends who support me and they love me and they check in on me and what more can a girl ask for? But of course, I still yearn for a romantic connection. I feel things. So while I roll out this pie dough and make this into a filling, let me present you with further spoken word. I want romance and I like touch. I like it when I trust you and I love it when I love you. There's a large part of me that wants you entirely, that wants you to want me entirely. But another large part of me, the part that has grown old, that knows what she wants is not what one can give or receive. Recently, someone asked me how many men I've fallen for. So I asked him how he defined that, falling in love. And he said, they feel like home and I want to stay. It is hard for me to say how many I've loved. I've certainly pined. At age six, I fantasized about marrying Jackie Chan, then Jet Li a few years later. I've crushed on boys all my life, but they didn't start to feel quite so crushing until college, where I crushed on a new boy every year, and every year it was a pain unrequited. And quite hopeless, especially the gay one, in junior year. And in senior year, I kissed my crush weeks after he told me I could just hold his hand if I wanted to without playing that silly slapping game, and days before we said goodbye him back home for the summer break, and me about to graduate. I didn't like the kiss, but I did like the cuddles. Sleepy and content and so comfortable. What felt so impossibly piercing in college feels more and more like memories now. A decade and a half later, a whole lifetime away, just entries on a page inside a scrapbook that I flipped to in my mind. I'm about to turn 34 this year. 
I told him, we never really grow up, we grow old. I'm pretty reckless when it comes to living. Quail eggs from three months ago, raw, in a batter, mm-hmm. The last guy who told me we were both foolish romantics sent me crawling back to therapy. I don't have it in me to be a romantic anymore. Not in body, not in mind, but just because I can't have it doesn't mean I don't want it. We're gonna preheat our oven to 375. We're going to line a sheet tray with a silk pad or parchment, and then we're gonna lay our little dough pieces on top. We're going to squeeze in our fillings and crimp the sides, however you wanna do it. This is like a pretty casual crostata or open-faced heart, I guess. In terms of how to navigate a romantic relationship, do you think I know that? Those who can't do teach, right? How do you find and maintain a healthy relationship with a partner? How do you find this affects your relationships? Do you ever feel like part of you was missing since our society is so obsessed with sex? Do you feel repulsed or grossed out by sexual thoughts or feelings? <sighs> we're gonna make a tiny egg wash to brush around the edges of the crostata, and then we're gonna sprinkle it with some sugar just for presentation and sparkle. I think for me personally, I dealt with a lot of guilt and shame surrounding sex because of my cultural background and my upbringing, the conservative values all played a part. Now that I'm becoming more and more open-minded, degaff, I don't really know how I feel about sex, to be honest with you. My partner of over a decade was not asexual, he was allosexual. And so that did create a lot of figuring things out together and wondering if this is gonna work. There was a lot of doubt and there was a lot of discussion, conversation, compromising, anger, frustration, sadness, hurt feelings, misunderstandings. All of it. <laughs> it can often be a deal breaker when I meet people these days, when I tell them about my A spectrum identity and they go, I don't think that's gonna work for me, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no need to apologize to me. <laughs> Been there, done that. Heard it all before. I think yes, I did feel like part of me was missing. I felt like part of me was broken. I felt like I needed to get sent back to the factory and become refurbished somehow. Um, I think over time I was open to trying sex, but I also discovered that I didn't really want sex a lot of the time So it felt like a burden for both me to be the sole sexual partner in that relationship and unfair to my partner Who wasn't really getting the sexual attention that he wanted and needed so towards the last half of our relationship We opened it up that way we could see other people He could get his physical needs fulfilled elsewhere. Maybe his emotional needs fulfilled elsewhere, too Was that an easy transition? Was that an easy experiment? Not at all. It was so fraught <laughs> There was a lot of need for communication on my part. There was a lot of jealousy coming out of me. I learned a whole new side of myself and just how weak I was in terms of emotionally and mentally preparing myself to share my person with other people and to not know where his head was at all the time. Do I regret it? I don't think so. I think I learned a lot because of it and for that I grew. It changed me. I feel like the same way I'm afraid of sex sometimes is the same way that some people can be afraid of intimacy in other contexts, like emotional vulnerability and sharing personal details about their life and their past. And I think it just means that we all connect differently and that we all trust differently and that everybody goes at a different pace. I have no problem talking about myself thoroughly on a first date, but I feel like some people might be getting very intimidated by my fast approach to revealing all parts of myself. And I think in the way that I can be quick to judge whether or not somebody's willing to open themselves up to me immediately is the same way that other people judge me for not being sexually open to a traditional romantic relationship dynamic, whatever that means. I think if I had to number it at this point, I would guess from my 20s onward, I've loved three men, boys, really, because we never really grow up, we just grow old. I think love is a drug, just like sugar, and I'm a soft addict to, to both, to both of those things. And maybe I consume too much of it to punish myself sometimes. Maybe it's disguised as trying to heal myself, but even the best treats can turn into weapons sometimes. As far as whether sexual exclusivity is important to me in a relationship, 
I would say I would prefer monogamous arrangements, but I'm not completely closed off to having another open relationship. I think it just depends on what the partner wants in the relationship and what they're open to trying. It's probably not easy dating anyone, and it's definitely not going to be easy if you're already off the bat not sexually compatible. Some people value sex more than others in a relationship, and that's just something that you guys have to talk about and negotiate, and that's something very much I'm trying to do. But whether or not you can actually reach an agreement, who knows? In terms of how to explain myself to potential partners, oh boy. I think the way that I was received in my asexuality on dating apps when I was in my 20s versus now in my 30s have definitely shifted. I always put it up front, it's always in my profile, I make sure that before I meet up with anyone in person for a date, I explain exactly what I identify as and I open the floor up for them to ask me questions. I find that this is particularly important for me to just set the grounds of expectations. The last thing I want to do is to mislead people in terms of what I'm willing and capable of providing for them in a relationship, seeing as how sex is so important to so many people. This has to be one of the non-negotiables of first date talks. And yes, I always make sure that they don't want kids, especially now in my 30s. We have people who want families ASAP, and man, not a fan of kids. That can be a whole other video, but I'm sure you know the reasons for why I don't want them. I think a lot of us fear being lonely and we're afraid to be upfront about what our own needs and wants and desires are because we're afraid of pushing away people too soon. But my reasoning now in my 30s is if you're not a fit, you're not a fit. That's it. We can talk about it if you're open to it, but if you're not open to it and I'm not open to it and we're both fairly certain about what we want out of life, then what more is there to say? If it's not a match, it's not a match. Did I just burn the roof of my mouth off? Yes. Was it worth it? Maybe. I've used a lot of metaphors to try to get this idea across of what it means to me to be Demi and Ace. The one that I think explains it the best for me is that sex is a foreign language that I don't understand or speak. A lot of people have described to me that sex brings them intimacy and understanding of their partners, and for me that just isn't the case. Do I understand a person better after I've had sex with them? Not in my experience, although my experience is pretty low. What I do find that helps me understand other people better is through talking. So for me, talking is kind of like other people's sex. Because sex is a foreign language I don't understand and I don't speak through, it's very awkward for me to try to communicate through it. Which is to say, I'm not against having sex, it just doesn't come naturally to me. And I don't really know how to work my way around it smoothly, I kind of just fumble through it. Imagine taking your four years of high school Spanish to Mexico and trying to communicate with people. If you were like a B student like I was, probably not going to be great. <laughs> you're going to know the basics of hi, hello, my name is, you're going to maybe order one or two tacos, and you're going to be flabbergasted when they speak back to you faster than ever before. Your brain just can't comprehend and you don't really know what your next reply should be. That's what sex feels like to me. So in terms of navigating a partner who can support me and is willing to be patient with me, I probably do need them to kind of take the lead and follow my guidelines for what I feel safe and what my boundaries are at any given moment, but they might have to teach me this new language if that makes sense. How does this intersect with our appalling sex ed in this country, with our taboos around sexuality, with our restrictions around what is the right way to be sexual and what are the wrong ways to be sexual? It's all in there. We've created a system that engenders shame endlessly. And so I feel a lot of shame. And I feel shame for being so old and not knowing how to sex. But I recognize that. And I also recognize that it's not really my fault. And I'm trying Trying to be forgiving to myself and I'm hoping to find other people who are allowing me to just be me where I am and meet me here. Another way I explain to people about my relationship with sex is I'm allergic to sex. In the same way that I'm allergic to alcohol, it doesn't mean that I don't partake in it, it just means that I know as soon as I partake in it, a part of me is going to suffer for it. Whether or not this is another intersectionality with my biology, sex can sometimes be very physically uncomfortable for me. And you know if something doesn't feel good, chances are I'm not gonna want it as much as the next person. Now just because I'm allergic to something doesn't mean I'm never gonna eat it. I have food allergies that kind of trigger my eczema and I still eat them. I'm just preparing myself to not like it the day after. Or in the case of sex, 
during it. <laughs> but you see, sometimes when you love a person enough, you're willing to do things that don't feel great to you, but still feel great to you because what feels great to them makes you feel great. So sex isn't really just a physical state of being and activity, it's also a mental, emotional, psychological state of being and activity, and it is very, very complex. For me at least. I know there are people who think that they can separate the physical from the psychological, but I am not one of those people. I have met people who identify on the ace spectrum before on dating apps. It hasn't really worked out with them because it's not just about your sexual compatibility. It's also about other parts of your personality and whether or not they're compatible. And now that we've opened this cream cheese, Let's make something else with it. Now, mom and I both love cheesecake, and we basically love cheesecake in any form it comes in. But when I was little, we used to go to Feida Bakery and we would get the Japanese style cheesecake. It's much fluffier. It's kind of like a cheesy angel food cake, if you will. No, I have never made it. I've always wanted to try it, but the kind of souffle cakes scare me because high chances of them failing, and we all know how we feel about failure. But I have come to embrace failure, both in my dating life and in the kitchen. So today, we're just gonna try it. We have the cream cheese, we have the eggs, we have some flour, we have the sugar. Do, do we need anything else? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows these days anyway, huh? And you know what? I'm going to attempt to make three flavors. One of them is going to be matcha, one of them is going to be ube, and the other one will just be plain cheese. I think after mom died, I stopped measuring my life in terms of failure and successes, and now we are just going for the experience because if you don't do stuff just because you're afraid of failing, then have you lived? If I kept waiting for the perfect moment, I don't know. Might have to wait forever. For the cheesecake, I'm gonna immersion blend together the cheese, the sugar, and some flour. Once your cream cheese mixture is smooth, I'm gonna add in our yolks, separating the whites into a clean, fatless bowl. We're going to let that combine until it's totally smooth. We'll separate our batter into three bowls and color them separately, flavoring them with matcha, ube, vanilla, whatever you want. Just so we're clear, I do not condone eating four month old eggs raw in a batter with raw flour, but you know, I'm a grown ass adult who can make her own sorry, sad decisions. We're here for the regrets. On a sheet tray, we're gonna place these mini molds. We're gonna spray them down with some nonstick spray, and then we're gonna whip our egg whites. For the egg whites, clean bowl, clean whisk, and we're gonna be streaming in a little bit of sugar gradually. This will help that structure of the meringue stay. And we're going to slowly stir in this egg white into each of our three batters. We're gonna preheat our oven to 325. At the bottom of the oven, I'm gonna place a small bowl or tray of boiling water. That way we can create a steam environment to help that souffle rise a little bit better. I'm gonna set a timer for about 20 minutes, but I'm gonna keep a close eye on these. I wanna see that their surface is getting nice and matte and puffy, but I don't want them to quite so crack. I don't wanna overbake them either, so I've never baked these before. I pulled our baby one out because it looks like it is overbaking, but that only took 10 minutes. I'm gonna leave the rest of them in for another five. I think by then we'll have cooked everything all the way through. You can see that when you pull something out immediately from a hot oven and it has so much air structure from whipped egg whites inside, it will start to shrink immediately. We can still eat it. Now, we're down to the nitty gritty. What are my views on sex? I've already let you guys know a lot of my thoughts on sex. Has it changed since I first felt like I was on the A spectrum? Yes. Absolutely it has. I entered college about, what, 17 years old. I'm currently almost 34. That is double my lifespan. I think it would be kind of creepy if my views on a lot of things in life didn't change in 17 years. I used to be sex repulsed. Now I'm more sex favorable. That doesn't mean that I want sex that often either. As I identify as demisexual, which means I only really develop sexual attraction and desire towards people that I've already developed a emotional bond and trusting relationship with, 
I haven't gotten to the point where I can just view casual sex with somebody I don't know all that well as a pleasurable event. I feel all the things and I feel them all the time. Do I only want to have sex with one person for the rest of my life? Not necessarily, but I am still pretty choosy because it's not that easy to develop a emotional bond and trusting relationship right off the bat like that. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of understanding, it takes a lot of friendship. Yes, I've had uncomfortable sexual experiences, but I've also had very pleasurable sexual experiences. Sometimes though, the amount of pleasure I get from those is just not enough to want me to get more next time. <laughs> you can say the payoff just isn't that high for me, so cost-benefit analysis, not always worth it. And you know, there is a lot of variety on the ACE spectrum. Just because I feel this way doesn't mean literally everybody else who identifies as ACE on some level identifies the same way as I do. We're all different people, we all like different things, and we've all tried different things. Our past is not the same, therefore our present and future will not be the same either. I wouldn't really say it took me that long to figure out I'm ace. I think I just realized that I'm not sexually motivated the way other people are. I think around 2010, 2011, when I was thinking about all of these things, asexuality as a sexual orientation wasn't all that known yet. And I think it still isn't, you know? Which is why we're kind of making this video so that we can talk about it. How do you differentiate whether or not you're ace or just hasn't met the right person? I mean, I guess you can't. If you're not sure, then I'm not sure for you. I'm definitely no god. I would say in the last 10 years, there were maybe two people that I felt immediate physical attraction towards, and both those times I was a little bit scared because they made me very uncertain of my orientation. After all, if I could just feel physically attracted to these people right off the bat without really knowing them for more than two hours, Am I still asexual? And I think that just depends on what you're comfortable with terming yourself. For me, I still feel like I'm demisexual. I'm open to sexual experiences with people who I trust and feel fondly towards and have emotional bonds with. How you identify and how you feel comfortable identifying and how comfortable you feel with yourself, I'm afraid that's a you journey. And I wish you the best of luck. It's gonna take some time and you're gonna have to try some things and you might get hurt in more ways than one, but you know, this is life. If we operate with the thought that we'll never get hurt, um, I d <laughs> and I think that's where community comes in. Once we have a community of people who are going through the same things, open conversations about it, we can feel less lonely, feel less weird, less marginalized, valid, and we can feel more confident in being unconfident. The older I get, the more I realize really nobody knows. And that is liberating. After all, if nobody has the answer, then any answer you come up with is probably just as good as the next person's. I'm obviously not encouraging you to go out and fight other people over who's right and who's wrong. I'm just saying maybe we're all right and maybe we're all wrong. <laughs> maybe what is most important to me is that we just let each other be, you know? We just let each other live the way they want to live, the way you want to live. I don't think this is a Japanese cheesecake at all, <laughs> but it smells nice and buttery and cheesy and sweet. Now, just because this isn't the perfect vision of what a Japanese cheesecake is, does it mean that it's any less good than what I get from the bakeries? I kind of have a feeling that mom might like this a lot. It's soft, it's spongy, it's a little bit springy, it's moist and dense, but not rubbery. And honestly, I might make this again, without a recipe, of course. As far as when I feel comfortable being sexual, I think it's all mostly psychology. I think ever since my mom died, I became more open to being a different person, and I approach dating differently now. I'm not saying I'm gonna really enter my slut era right now, but I'm also just saying that, hey, if I find the right person and I feel comfortable around them and they want to have sex, maybe I want to have sex too. Who knows? I'm just trying to stay open, whatever that means. But I'm also recognizing that it took a major life shift for me to get snapped out of that mentality of I'm asexual, I don't feel comfortable engaging physically with anyone that I meet for the first year, maybe. I've definitely had very intense infatuations with people who needed sex and because I was not willing to engage in that level I was not able to continue any sort of romantic relationship with them. Do I have regrets? I used to. And I used to think, well, maybe if I just did try to have sex with
with them, I could have had something with them. But now looking back, they were all just learning experiences and I wasn't ready. That's the main focus here is are you ready to explore different things? And if you're not, forcing yourself to be ready doesn't make you ready. It just makes you repressed and confused. I've definitely had sex before where I wasn't feeling it, but I knew I should. And I'm trying to grow out of that. And I think I've done a pretty good job in the last two years. And it will be an ongoing project. Lifelong to know where I stand, to know what I want, and to protect myself to ensure that I get what I want in all arenas of life. Not at the sacrifice of others, but more so finding people who can work with me and be on the same page without either one of us hurting the other. Whether it comes to jobs, relationships, friendships, whatever, that's a very important thing to gauge for yourself. Where are you? Where is the other person? And do you see this being sustainable? And I know in all of my recent videos, I keep coming back to my dead mom, but the reality is when somebody that big in your life goes away, changes are about to happen that you can't stop. It has been 17 months since mom died and it has been living through 17 months of an earthquake and rebuilding. In deciding where to put the pieces, I think I'm making her proud by making me proud first. Step one is in accepting the change because I have no choice. Step two is to welcome the change and step three is to find joy in the change. Try new things. Be a slightly different person. Experiment. Even if you're uncertain, especially if you're uncertain. Looking at how moist these are, I'm thinking maybe next time fewer eggs. It's pretty fun to see the differences between all of these flavors because the matcha sank a lot. I think we used a lot of egg white in there proportionally speaking versus the ube one. It sank a little bit but not nearly as drastic as the matcha one. They almost look like popovers. It really just kind of blew up with the egg whites steaming in the oven and then shrank as soon as that structure collapsed. Got a nice glossy top though. Look at that. In a lot of ways, navigating relationships has been a lot like baking blind. You just try things, there's no playbook, and you make notes of what went wrong and what went right and what you liked and what you didn't, and you try to do it slightly differently next time. Or you give up altogether and decide you don't like cheesecakes. Unfortunately, I still like cheesecakes a lot. But the good thing is, I like apples too. This one happens to be a very good one. Now you may be thinking, June, there's a lot of recipes for Japanese cheesecake on the internet. Why don't you just go look one up and make it according to the recipe? To which I say, yeah, you're totally right. Of course I can do that. But have you ever followed a recipe and have it not come out the way it looked like it would, that you expected it would? Maybe the recipe book made you think that you too could make it exactly like what it looks like on the picture. Sometimes if the recipe development is good enough, yeah you might be able to attain perfection, but most times it probably doesn't come out the way you want it to. I think for me, in terms of relationships, there was always this ideal blueprint of how things would go down. I'd meet a boy, we like each other, we hold hands, we kiss, we have sex, we marry, I don't know, we have kids, buy a house somewhere, he has a good job, I have a good job, our kids grow up to be the healthiest boys and girls ever, and that's everything that my mom would have wanted for me for sure. Mom wanted a lot of me and for me, which made me kind of want a lot for myself, but I realized at some point that I didn't want any of that. I rebelled against her and in a sense, I rebelled against myself and I started to retrain myself because I felt like things the way they were taught to me just didn't seem to work for me. And I think we're at a point in history where a lot of us are beginning to realize like, hey, this bullshit actually doesn't make much sense at all, does it? And I don't know, maybe when enough of us do recognize that this doesn't work for us, we'll actually just start to find our own ways, cook our own things, stop following recipes, and it's gonna take time for me to figure that out too. If mom got to the age of almost 62 without having figured everything out, what makes me think I can have everything figured out by the time I'm 34? I'm not that special as much as I want to think that. Remember when I said we clean that out by making a smoothie in it? The time has come. Turns out we still have to clean it. No shortcuts in life. I've also learned in the past year and a half how to take breaks. So today, I think we're done baking. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, who knew that eating sugar will cause breakouts? You know what they say, everything in moderation, but your girl doesn't know how to moderate.
I think to have a little bit of health in our balanced diet of pastries and baked goods, we should try to make some carrot cake next. And we're gonna be answering the question of, do I feel hope or do I feel despair? Does it feel lonely? Yeah, sometimes, but I don't think this is a problem that's specific to ace people. I think on some level we all feel lonely, don't we? I think most of you who watch my live streams certainly are because I am. And I make those live streams because I'm lonely and I know some people out there are lonely too. You're not alone. It just feels like it. Does it seem like it's hard to find a partner that has the same mindset that you do? It's not just about sexual compatibility here. It's about every aspect of who is suitable to become your lifetime partner. And even if you find a person who does seem appropriate and a good fit, you might not have them forever. My last relationship was about a decade. It still ended on good terms. We're still friends because people change, life moves, and time just goes by. Sooner or later, you outgrow or they outgrow, or it's just a mutual understanding of we want different things now. And I think for me, that's totally okay. I mean, as long as you can acknowledge it and not blame each other for the disappointment that will inevitably come from change happening, then you're all good. You're set for your next adventure. If given the opportunity, would you date another ace person? I don't know. I, I truly don't know. I think if I met the right ace person who seems to mesh well with me in all other respects, that seems great. But even within the ace spectrum, we might not be on the same page about what sexual compatibility is. So that in itself, needs a conversation even though we are all on the A spectrum. It just really is a case by case basis. I mean, would I date someone just because they identify as ace but like have no other things in common with me? Probably not. That's probably not a good fit. And on the front of do I feel despair? Sometimes in my deepest, darkest, loneliest moments, of course, but do I feel hopeless? I would say I don't feel hopeful, but I also don't feel hopeless. I'm still going on dates. I'm still trying to find folks Folks that can be friends, platonic or otherwise, and I'm having fun while doing it for the most part. Now in terms of carrot cake, I have some non-negotiables. Usually there should always be cream cheese frosting, but I used all the cream cheese yesterday, so now we are just going off the rails. Obviously we need carrot. I'll also be using walnuts and raisins. We're gonna use these last two eggs from before last Thanksgiving. <laughs> Live on the edge, you know? some sweetened coconut shreds that I'm gonna toast first. I found these dry ass marshmallows. Why not? A little bit of poppy seeds for texture and spices, duh. Some flax for health, leaveners and salt. I also have some of this overwhelmingly molassesy red sugar. Mm. Smells like medicine. Hope you're ready for chaos. I'm gonna use a combination of butter and olive oil, but when I went to reach for the butter, I found a little bit of cream cheese. We have a little bit to work. I think we might make a whipped topping with this cream cheese and a little bit of Greek yogurt. And I think instead of olive oil, I'm gonna use coconut oil. I think we're just gonna throw all kinds of crazy wild stuff in here. I still think fondly of all whom I've loved, just to varying degrees. There were those whom I never quite knew and those who hurt me quite intensely. Perhaps one has even broken me. But to move us away from this paradigm of winning and losing, one being good and better, the other being bad and worse, I'd like to offer us this. That to be broken means I was whole and now I am disabused of coherence. Coherence is coercion and coercion is violence. There is always violence, especially in love. If not to others, then especially to self. When I asked my college friend how she defined love, it involved the willingness to sacrifice the self for the other. Bro sets, what a mess. <laughs> but now I want to dig a little deeper. In love, the self is the other. In love, I receive as I give. Even pain is not pain if it engenders joy. I don't recommend it, but three and a half month old eggs could be fine. I've grown used to sad things, so they are wholesome now. Know thyself. 
then look beyond. I don't know guys. Think about it this way. You may not know that many ace folks, but we're not all that different from people who are not ace. How do we feel about this? We all experience loneliness to various degrees and we all have a longing to connect with other people. What is very interesting to me as someone who's on the ace spectrum is this conflation of sex and sexual intimacy with companionship and Trust. What exactly constitutes fulfillment in a relationship is pretty fascinating because it fluxes from person to person. slightly peel. I don't want to overbake it. The marshmallows are very nice and toasty. This cake looks and smells golden brown and delicious, but we cannot cut into it yet because uh, it's way too hot and we need it to set a little bit better. For our next question and dessert, we will be making chocolate cake. Chocolate cake was the thing that I wanted to make when I first started making this video. I was out walking one day and I was just like, wow, I crave chocolate cake. I don't know why, but I crave it. So today we will make it. In my pantry, I found this extremely expired can of evaporated milk. It will do amazingly in our cake. In addition, we have two different types of cocoa and we also have some carob which is like a cocoa substitute for those of us who can't have cocoa as well as some mesquite it has a slightly cocoa-y flavor we're just gonna throw it all in there add a touch of cloves for a little bit of sweetness and warmth and uh, we'll wing it and I think for intrigue we're gonna go in with a little bit of hot honey just to add a little chili vibe keep things spicy when making chocolate cake, I really like to bloom the cocoa, which means I hit it with a lot of hot liquid. In this case, I think we can just heat up this evaporated milk and bloom the cocoa in it. And while that batter is still very hot, I'm going to put in some chocolate chunks until it's nice and melted. While I make some chocolate cake, let's answer this last question. What does an ideal relationship look like to you? I love the fact that this comment already recognizes that an ideal relationship doesn't really exist, but I believe it's time for another poetry session. <laughs> I've made more friends than I have partners, though perhaps it is time to redefine for myself what the difference is, if there is any. I want what I assume you want. Transparency, honesty, perhaps because I hate not knowing, I'd rather grasp the ways in which you might hate me. I used to hate much more of myself. I do not recommend baking with quail eggs. They are very hard to crack. These days, I am trying not to be more loving, just be more allowing. Kindness that is organic and not forced out of dictation or obligation. Now this could backfire severely, but I'm gonna try to make this a gluten-free cake by using only buckwheat flour. I think for me, it's really important to be with someone that I admire and trust and rely on without, you know, being codependent. And I really wanna be with someone who I wouldn't mind and maybe even actively want to become more like with time. This looks like a very good consistency because whether or not it's conscious, the more time you spend with someone, the more you become like them. I think in the interest of time, we are gonna be making little cupcakes. They will bake faster because of the increased surface area. Tastes okay so far. And I think it doesn't matter if they're ace or not, as long as they're willing to engage in conversation and they appreciate me in all of my horrific glory there is a lot of horror in the glory, then it could be a go, but still haven't found them yet. Maybe one day soon. Our carrot cake looks pretty decent, although the structure is somewhat cracked due to the marshmallows melting and leaving air pockets, but let's have a taste, shall we? I'm not exactly sure how I managed to do it, but the amount of marshmallows in here is the perfect sweetness. Plus, these little caramelized marshmallows, crunchy, we love it. Nice little black sesame crust on the bottom there. Mm-hmm, but I didn't forget about that cream cheese. 
half Greek yogurt, half cream cheese, a little bit of powdered sugar. Going straight on top. Pretty sure I'm gonna be late for my date in uh, 20 minutes, but we gotta eat cake. A girl's gotta have her priorities, you know? Cake always first. It's not traditional. There's still bits of melty marshmallow in here, but this might be one of my favorite carrot cakes I've ever made. Maybe one of my favorite carrot cakes I've ever eaten. I mean, am I just eating the cream cheese frosting? Probably. Cream cheese frosting, always the best frosting. Fight me on that. Also, if you don't have raisins on walnuts in your carrot cake, you're just, you haven't lived, my dear. It's time, YOLO. gluten-free chocolate cake already proving to be quite fragile and light in texture. Mmm. It's a little bit dry. The flavor is fantastic, but it kind of just sucks all the moisture out of your mouth straight away. But you know what they say, nothing a little bit of cream cheese frosting can help. I mean, we basically have our own little hostess thing going on here. That is indeed the move and for all of you who are aghast at watching me put walnuts in my chocolate cake my friends why not a true trash masterpiece i think it works quite well you know a little bit of like cookies and cream vibe going on and now that i am officially late for my date i'll see you tomorrow um moving to chengdu you wish. Yes, I do wish. <laughs> Say hi, guys. Half the menu is vegetarian. Are you going to eat the whole thing tonight? We'll see. I don't know how much food it is. How much did you pay? 30 bucks, 31 for three things. I got, uh, Emendatsi, the national dish of Bhutan. Delicious spicy stew made of fresh chili peppers, scallions, tomatoes, and locally produced cheese. Shamudatsi, a flavorful dish made with oyster mushrooms, fresh chilies, tomato, and locally produced cheese. Bhutan is a very cheese country. Some purple rice. Purple rice! And more Smells spicy. Rice. Oh, that's a lot of purple rice. Are you gonna give me some to take home? Want? Cheese and momo! The Emendatsi and cheese momo. Cabbage, cilantro, and locally produced cheese.